M friends, last week I constructed this World War I trench diorama with a stuck A7V tank. Tonight we'll start painting, but we'll focus on the model for now, because it's gonna be the saddest tank ever, and I don't wanna make it any sadder. And as usual I'll start with a coat of black primer. The model has many different textures, smooth plastic, textured armor plates, some photo edge and metal rivets. All of these have to be unified for a good, durable paint job. And, of course, a black primer allows us to start post-shading the model from the get-go. Ok, it's a box on tracks, there won't be many shadows, but anyway. <laughs> I started by spraying the lower hull and running gear with a reddish-brown color. Because some of this area is gonna be visible in the diorama, I couldn't leave it black. And an oxide red primer color seemed a logical solution here. Now, onto the camouflage. I made a color profile in Photoshop where I tried to recreate the real A7V number 504 as close to historical photos as possible. What caught my eye was the four tone camouflage, sloppily painted crosses, and most importantly, the sad skull at the front. <laughs> Some modelers enjoyed these AK weathering pencils for their intended purpose. Weathering. I really love them for sketching the camouflage, because if you make a mistake you can easily erase them with water. Once I was happy with the layout, I painted over the sketch with a reddish brown color. No, I'm not starting with the base color, in this case dull green. We'll approach the camouflage differently. In fact, it's gonna be painted in completely reverse order, but I think you'll see the benefits of this approach at the end. I also added some rudimentary highlights towards the upper half of the hull. It's not something special for now, we'll hit the model with proper shading once the camouflage is done. So that's the red. And now we can add the masks. I don't like masking at all, I'd rather paint everything with a paintbrush, but in this case spraying and masking made more sense because the model is massive. And this masking rubber, or buddy, makes it pretty easy. Although, as always, the masking part takes more time than the spraying part. Huh, moving on. <laughs> the earth brown color was mixed from these paints. I added generous amounts of Tamiya X22 clear varnish into every paint mixture. This makes the painted surface smoother, but more importantly, the dried paint is saturated. If I used flat colors, as in straight from the bottle with some thinner, they turn much darker after the final coat of varnish. So adding gloss varnish makes your paintwork smoother and it also protects your post shading from um, unpredictable results. Ok, brown camouflage is done. So let's mask it as well. It's slowly starting to make sense, right? I'm just adding more masking putty and the more surface I cover with it, the smaller the workload. While I was spraying the brown, I noticed how the red overspray kept messing with me. So I better got rid of it by spraying a very thin coat of black primer, pretty much giving me a clean canvas for the next color. The wannabe ochre was made from these, and as I said, gloss varnish is a very important component in these mixtures. They don't have to dry to a perfectly glossy surface each and every time, although that's never a bad thing. The most important thing is saturating them with the clear varnish. And why it's a wannabe ochre paint? Well, because mixing ochre is my weak spot. <laughs> I'd much rather have some dark yellowish sandy color or whatever, but for the life of me I just can't mix a nice ochre paint. Anyway, let's mask this one as well, and in fact this makes the model ready for the final color, the base color. Which should normally come first, but I think you can already see the point of this reverse order. The dull green color was mixed from these. I know, quite a lot of different bottles, but it's a very specific desaturated green with a strong hint of blue. I don't know about the historical accuracy of this color, but the moment I saw it in Ammo's catalog many, many years ago, I just knew I had to paint a tank with this color one day. It's just that I prefer working with Tamiya paints and using leveling thinner, so I had to mix this weird green myself. And yeah, now we're painting the entire tank, so it's not gonna be a huge blob of black anymore. 
Also, every color in this palette was highlighted with deck tan. It gives them a nice, desaturated look without being too over the top like, let's say, pure white. And that's a pretty nice dull green, isn't it? But let's get to the moment of truth. So, the whole point of this reverse painting order was to minimize masking and make the process more streamlined. Instead of painting the green base first, then masking, let's say, the red-brown, spraying it, removing the mask, masking another color, and repeating that for every part of the camouflage, that just wouldn't be fun and the results might not be very good either. The only disadvantage was I had to test if the colors work together on a paint mule, aka on an old model, and I had very little to no control over the highlights and shading, but that's completely okay because we're gonna fix that right now. So this whole stage was about freehanding the highlights over each camouflage color. This way I have full control over the post shading because I can see how each patch looks next to each other. The disadvantage, of course, is the tight working conditions and the possible overspray. But hear me out. Because these paints are so over diluted, we're talking like 90% thinner, the overspray is hardly noticeable. And even if it happens, I think it actually contributes to the final appearance of the model, because it kinda softens the contrast between these, let's be honest, very strong colors. And because I'm only using deck tan to highlight every mixture, they all have something in common, so the final result is going to look more natural. There's of course the question of how far you should take the highlights. Personally, I like to go as far as possible, to a point where the highlight color looks more like deck tan than the original paint, but of course, the lighter the color, the smaller area it should cover. Not to mention, this stage allowed me to fix any mistakes and imperfections caused by the masking putty. And although the result of this stage isn't too extreme, it's quite the difference compared to its raw state. <laughs> the final missing detail was the black outlines. I used German grey because it appears black on most surfaces, but at the same time it's not black, so it looks more natural. I'm sure that makes perfect sense. <laughs> and I like making these with a long liner paintbrush. Any imperfections will just add to the character because in real life this was all done by hand as well. Anyway, most of the camouflage work is now done, so let's um let's spray some markings now. I was lucky enough to know a fellow modeler who made these custom stencils for me. I designed them in Photoshop using the historical photos as a guide, and <laughs> you wanna know something interesting? This all happened like seven years ago, right when this model was released by Mink. So technically speaking, this project and this video series have been seven years in the making. Although back then I didn't even think for a split second that I'd be making YouTube videos about my models. Anyway, when I'm spraying any kind of markings, I kinda like to post shade them as well, making some of the camouflage paint shine through and also making the marking colors look more translucent and faded. Some stencils were rather complex, um, this large cross consisted of uh, five individual stencils I think. The only insignia that was easier to paint with the brush was the black shield at the front. This is where the sad school resides, and I paid extra attention to replicate its shape and sad face as accurately as possible. It always makes me chuckle seeing how they considered this <laughs> intimidating and cool more than 100 years ago. But who am I to judge? But moving forward, I also applied the large air identification stripe on the roof, and with that, the markings were done. This is undeniably the most marked, most colorful model in my collection so far. But there's still one more step that will make the base coat even more interesting. Ammo shaders have become one of my favorite painting tools, and I love to use them as a sort of airbrushed pin wash. They can be used to outline details, but also to add more artificial shadows and contrast between different components. 
Some things look better if they're done with the proper enamel or oil pin wash, of course. So I mostly focused this effect on bolts, rivets, small hinges and the most prominent lines such as around moving panels. The result is... I think you can probably see why I love them so much. Okay, all that was left now was to give the model a generous coat of flat varnish. The surface was cluttered with different intensities of flat, satin and gloss, so this gave it a nice uniform look. The flat surface will be very important in the diorama, but I'll talk about it in another video when the time is right, okay? Finally, the tracks were base coated with German grey, which is a very good base color for steel finishes, and to prepare them for weathering, I gave them an uneven coat of flat brown. Acting is a very basic sketch for rust and earth tones. And with that, the model is ready for weathering, my friends. The irony is strong here, because on one hand, this is just a base coat and the model is now gonna receive all those fancy weathering techniques, and on the other hand, it looks just how I was imagining and hoping it would look like, so I'm kinda hesitant to add too many special effects. But hey, maybe spending more time and giving the base coat more love than usual will make the upcoming techniques easier. What's for sure is that this is the craziest looking camouflage I've done so far, and I'm in full honesty very happy with how it turned out. I thought post-shading a four-tone camouflage with sharp borders would be a nightmare, but it was pretty awesome and I had a great time. So in the next episode we'll do something, <laughs> okay? I'll start with a pin wash, that's for sure, and then there will be chipping, rust tones and all the sweet stuff. In the meantime, thank you for watching my friends and thank you to my patrons who make this show possible. If you like what I'm doing, want to get more of it and in return support my work, you can go to my Patreon page and see what kind of rewards would you like. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench, we can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails, I'm posting one week early ad free videos so you could watch the weathering video right now, and also these beautiful studio photos that you can download in full resolution. And last but not least, some real life references for dioramas, sceneries and landscapes. And of course small 3D models for detailing your tanks and dioramas. So yeah, this was a ton of fun and also an awesome airbrushing experience. I learned a bunch of new things, tried something I haven't done before and it felt refreshing. If you want an armor model that's gonna stand out in your collection, just grab one of those World War One kits. But anyways, I'm off to my workbench now, okay? And you, my friends, stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers! <laughs>